as every family is a galaxy and every galaxy is others. My mother's love was deep, unsparing as cosmic law, noble and flawed, a supernova of dark matter, spinning light and heat. My whole life, I traipsed the unloved streets of New York, retracing the implosion of our catch and release. To say there's nothing left in Chinatown for me is to revisit its particulars, the heaps of trash on every corner, the rivers of fish blood running into its sewers. I once saw a couple of Napa cabbage propped against a fire hydrant, like a pair of pale jade sentinels. But that package bound for California, stuffed with silk and gold, appeared when I was 10 years old, when my grandparents told me that an uncle had had a baby boy. Light began pouring from the open box as if the power of the gift of being male was an astral happening happening in a kitchen on Mott Street. I was dizzy from the dazzling rays bouncing off the foil covered walls, the blinding revelation that my almond eyes were a prize this boy would never need. That being born to a hippie mother from the Midwest still bested being me, the daughter of a daughter and a low fun. My dad used to laugh at pale face and white devil, whereas I wanted all the variables lined up on my side of the ledger. Never good at math, too often give me half and I am happy. A true American. Here among the roses and the rot grows a plot that also raises me. A pen that writes before it dies. A machine made candy landscape with 2000 kinds of cereal plus corn dust to scuff up with the gun in my boot. Proof that I am American is my callousness. I care, but how much do I spare anything with which I am reluctant to part? Possessions are one way to chart a life. Among mine is a nativity scene in which everyone is Chinese. I thought every country had its own Jesus until I was five. Today, I cherish time, small God of possibilities and poems that think, plus genre of allegiance to American things like running from the past, like cross-pollination and desegregation. So many bees, so many boys dying in the fields and streets, so much beauty and goodwill squandered as in the gesture of a single rose botched Valentine. Who knows why so little goes as planned, why so little planning goes into anything any more than I can inherit the earth, can America be my father? Like money banked beneath the mattress, I hoard memories. Half the time, they're not even mine. We are alike in this way. Like the man who lost his wife driving home from a party when a horse crashed through their windshield, killed her dead, and left him unharmed with his hat still on his head. That man was a father, your father and mine, and the woman, your mother, and your sister. Do you get where I'm going with this again with the deer and our collective memory of apples, a common dream of lightning, and the phantom family I've lost? just as my husband's long ago hair catches air when he rolls down the window, does my every move tingle with activated absence. Yes, and the broken simile of it is my imagination that will not put the horse back in its stable or hair back on the head, that moves not to fix the clan. For there are answers, but not a lot of questions any more than I am made of what I am afraid of, then you are too. So get this, the truth is of no consequence to me. Personal mythology, that most American language of anguish and anxiety lacks privacy, as lost in art as fireflies in a mason jar, as lucidity itself, that we quit hoarding and collect ourselves and find other kinds of conservation, disrupt no language with pain, that we reclaim permission to dream a little dream, dreamy and permissive as America, enchanted as land revised over time, rooted in lack, like every aspiration seeks power to pressure a form. How the storm left every twig 
on every branch encased in a layer of ice, how nature entered my life. Snow melting in the green mountains makes a rushing sound in spring. How my father recounted this same scene standing on the corner of Church Street. I couldn't explain that I wasn't ready for the snow or for anything else, or how now I am almost ready for everything. So I think that's 20 minutes, right? <laughs> so, that's um, amazing. Thank you. Thanks. That's amazing. I just I love the poem. I love the way you read it. Thank you. And I, I love the line about Jesus. Yeah, and an astonishing grade of work, Tina. Yeah, just, just beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, you know, it, it's almost like you want to pause and digest and chew over what you just heard. And and I urge you, I urge you, if you're listening to my words, um, if you're within the sound of my voice, please go out and check these poets' work online, at your local library, at your local indie bookstore. Um, you know, they all have uh, amazing books out there. Go out, get them. They're, they're, they make great presents too, by the way. Um, and support poetry and support the arts. Our, our next featured poet, and, and if I was good at alpha, you know, the alphabet, I would, Nicole would have gone first, but I forgot that C-A-L comes before C-A-N. Uh, Nicole Callahan writes poems, stories, and essays. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in various places, among others, American Poetry Review, Painted Bride Quarterly, Tin House, Copper, Nickel, Flume, and as a Poem a Day feature from the Academy of American Poets. Her books include the 2012 nonfiction Henry R River Mill Village, which she wrote with Ruby Young Keller, and which documented the rise and fall of a tiny mill village turned ghost town, North Carolina, as well as Superloop, a collection of poems published in early 2014. In 2015, she received with Zoe Ryder White the Baltic Writing Residency Chapa Contest Award for their chapbook, A Study in Spring, which was released by Rabbit Catastrophe Press. Her book, The Deeply Flawed Human, was released by Deadly Chaps Press. And in summer 2017, Finishing Line Press published Downtown. In spring 2018, Aging was released by Yes Poetry. And in summer 18, Tran Translucence, um, a dual language cross-culture collaboration with Palestinian poet Samar Javir Abdel was published by Indolin Books. The Couples, her novella, was published in summer 2019 from Mason Jar Press. Her latest project, Elsewhere, another collaboration with Zoe Ryder White, won the 2019 Sixth Finch Chapbook Prize and will be released, or has it already been released, uh, Jennifer, in the spring of 2020. Um, she is the assistant director and a senior language lecturer at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering, and she frequently collaborates with artists and actors throughout New York City. And with that, the floor and the mic are yours, Nicole. Uh, thanks, Neil. <laughs> that was sort of exhausting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's been released. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, and it's not my latest project. I've got a jillion projects always. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I feel so honored to be here. Um, Tina, it was so great to hear you read that poem. I don't know. I may, oh, there you are. <laughs> there you are. You're a little square. Um, I didn't know about an organizing principle today, so I was going to read funny poems. So here, watch me be funny. Feeding time. With a plastic bag of stale hot dog buns, I stood at the mouth of the river. I said, Lord, I have come back, and this is what I have to offer. And the Lord said, Nicole, you have not come back. You were never here. And I said, Lord, I have stood atop the little red star that says, you are here, and I believe in those words. And the Lord said, Nicole, your belief becomes you. And I blushed. And the Lord said, Nicole, there are times you have made a fool of yourself. And I said, yes, Lord. And the Lord said, and times you have made a fool of others. And I said, 
Sorry, Lord. And the Lord said, Nicole, what color is the sky? And I said, bluish, Lord, but tomorrow it will look like snow. And the Lord said, you do not know what tomorrow will look like. And I said, oh, Lord, LOL, I don't even remember what yesterday looked like. And the Lord said, Nicole, are you hungry? And I said, not really. And the Lord said, then why are you eating those gross hot dog buns? And I said, I don't know, Lord, boredom. And so the Lord lifted his big hand to his face and created a storm of such magnitude that even Sam Campbell said, this is going to be the big one. And the mouth of the river opened to swallow me whole and the sky turned a shade I didn't recognize from the earth. And the Lord laughing said over and over, bored, bored. And when finally the Lord stopped laughing, I sat on the shore of what was once the river and I tore the remaining hot dog buns into tiny pieces and threw those pieces to what was left of the fishes. Hilarious, right? The coffee clutch. For a short time, I was in a coffee clutch. A group of Brooklyn mothers, all of PS 29 second grade girls who palled around with their braids and their Girl Scout uniforms, and on Fridays went to gymnastics in Manhattan. Manhattan. These girls and their mothers and I and my girl would take the A train to Chambers Street. The girls playing souped up versions of patty cake, the mothers complaining about the girls or the husbands or the jobs they had left for their husbands and the girls. Quite religiously, we'd meet at the little coffee shop on the corner of Warren and Court. And Sarah, the very rich one, might be a little high. And Mandy, the really broke one with the videographer X, would probably be crying a little. And Jamie would have her paper calendar and be very on top of things. And Leah would be a little under the weather. And every time we'd meet, I'd empty two packets of sweet and low into my matcha green tea. And I'd have this nearly imperceptible fantasy while stirring the sweet and low into the matcha that I would cause an explosion that our little corner of Brooklyn would suddenly burst into flames, that I'd have to watch first the invisible makeup melt off, then the skin of the faces, the skin around the neck, the clavicle, the bones of the arms. And one day I said, sometimes I worry my sweet and low matcha will cause an explosion. Someone laughed, said, no, but it will give you cancer, which is why I bring it up now. One of the lesser discussed aspects of having cancer is imagining all the poor choices you made which contributed to it. There are the cigarettes, of course, cliche, all that wine, also cliche, but then there's the tab which my mother fed me from a straw the vats of French onion dip that held me over during the first 100 days of isolation, the huge bites of orange mac and cheese I still take from my daughter's plate, the fish sticks, the lettuce unwashed, pears absently devoured without even cleaning the skin on my blue jeans, even the air, just walking around, breathing the air, sucking it in, and the stress, how people say, You've always been quite hard on yourself, the very Virgo-ness of it, the every little packet you have ever ripped open, open, anticipating the end of the world and finding, well, finding what you find. The examination. I'm also um, debuting my tattoo, my mom tattoo. I'm very excited. Never had it exposed during a reading, so mom, both um, descriptive and a little shout out to my mother. The examination. This is a pre-cancer poem. Do I need to say that? I don't know. How does your body feel right now? Like I waded into an above ground pool in a Target bathing suit? Like I'm a European man with dry mouth. Like I want to put my fingers somewhere. Like I wondered that 
I wonder if that thigh chafing butter stick works. Like I've got to pee out these two glasses of kombucha. Come closer. Like I reek of Tampa, like a swallow of wine. Come even closer. Like I'm standing in an elementary school talking to other mothers about snacks. Like I need mouthwash. Like I need someone to slap me. Closer still, like a radiant pig. Now stay. How does your central nervous system feel right now? I was just thinking, what if I do have satin walls? What if I do love cranes? I think probably I am the enemy, but I like you. Usually the chain around my ankle embarrasses me. A ring of eczema where my ring should be. Also, under the bridge, the snake eating the bluegill. I was hungry too. Am, I should say, am, will be. A wife, throat knot, heart knot, what not. I've draped my wet pants over the radiator, and I swear I will not cry publicly. Not here, not today. And your brain, how does it feel? Funny that you ask. It feels like billions of nerve cells arranged in patterns to coordinate thought, emotion, behavior, movement, and sensation. An egg frying on a pan, sheet music, an egg in a nest, an egg being pushed out of a bird, getting laid by a bird. My mother still radiant when they took her, a slapped face slapped again, that painting with its sky, the broken shell of a robin's blue egg clinging to my thumbnail. To get to the other side, do you ever feel like an alien? I asked Cliff. He's arranging my body on the radiation table. Usually I apologize for my muddy boots, but today I'm feeling more and more like my childhood alien abduction dreams were actually dreams about middle-aged cancer treatment. Like you've taken me from a field of poppies, I say, and are performing bizarre intergalactic experiments on me. Cliff laughs and secures my arm in the vise. He closes the 12 inch steel door behind him. Once I'm inside the radiation tube, I'm not supposed to think about Marie Curie's cataracts or her fingernails falling off or the fact that her casket is made of lead. So instead, I repeat over and over, healing radiant light, healing radiant light. And when I get bored of repeating healing radiant light, I make up jokes instead. Horse walks into a bar with a camel hanging from his mouth. Bartender says, need a healing radiant light? Cliff is on the other side of the glass. His voice booms through the speaker. You ready, he says. Why did the woman cross the road to get to the healing radiant light? Cliff tells me to breathe in. Deeper, deeper, that's it, he says, and hold. At least I get to be the human, I'll tell him if he comes back. Deeper, deeper, healing, radiant, knock, knock, light, healing, radiant, light, who's there, healing and release, he says. I open my eyes to see the pine trees they've painted on the ceiling to trick my mind into thinking I'm lying in a field on the earth staring up through the green into the blue, sh blue spacious sky. The eye of the machine scans me, beeps, hold. And again, Cliff says, how many women does it take to screw in a healing radiant light bulb? One. That was the punchline. <laughs> um... <laughs> Desclamation. The room downstairs was in need of a good healing. Oh, no. 
The room downstairs was in need of a good cleaning, but it was my room, or perhaps because it was my room, it was in need of a good cleaning. Not that I had dragged in dirt from the garden, but that I was shedding the outermost membrane of my skin. In 2011, the same year I lost one pregnancy and found my last, Charles Weschler and his colleagues explained that humans shed their entire outer layer of skin every two to four weeks. This seems counter to the seven, degree, seven years I learned in grade school when my second favorite joke was, your epidermis is showing. But yes, since I began these sentences, I've likely shed 0 0.009 ounces of skin, which doesn't sound like a lot, but line by line, it adds up. And so by the time my husband visits my downstairs room, he might drag his finger across the dust of my desk and ask how I can live this way. I am living, yes, and this way. The scientific term is desquamation from the Latin desquamere, meaning, quote, to scrape the scales off a fish, unquote. Each summer comes a morning when walking to the river, I discover a number of dead fish have washed up onto the bank and I'm startled, a hook in my heart. And each summer on that morning, I promise myself I will never be startled again. I will not be startled again. Oh, dust, I am not the same woman who began this poem. Michael, I love your cigarette. It's so great. You, you make me crave, a, crave another life, another world, another time. <laughs> so thank you. That's my job. <laughs> Thanks. The extravagant stars. Everybody says the stars are dead. By the time the light reaches us, blah, 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 as if the light itself is not enough. Or maybe everybody says most stars are dead. Or some of the people say all the stars are dead and all the people say some of the stars are dead. Is the sun dead? I don't know. I can't remember. One in two women can't remember one in two things. I have all these facts in my head, these claims about the world, caterpillars, supernovas, the days getting shorter, longer again, the riverbed, our great confluence, the buzz of that particular fly. Did you ever get my postcard from Mexico? Mostly I write the same word over and over and mostly that word is light. I keep saying it seems very unlikely that this will kill me, but why unlikely? Medically speaking, you have a one in 500 chance of being born with 11 fingers or toes. I had a student once without thumbs. I wanted him to write a poem about it. He used his hands like lobster claws. He made me so sad or I was so sad and he reminded me of my sadness. He didn't want to write about his thumbs, he said. Okay, I said. Probably he wrote about outer space. Some years after that, I had a terrible late-term miscarriage and had to go to a terrible late-term abortion clinic with terrible, terrible lighting. Afterwards, they gave me a root beer flavored lollipop. I sat in a blue chair and sucked on my lollipop. I was a little girl and an old woman I cried audibly. I was in my prime. One in four women will this. One in eight women will that. One in 15 women will this and that. And yet the death rate of stars is only one about every 10,000 years or so. Meaning the naked eye will probably never see a dead star. You're looking into the past, yes, but it's unlikely though not impossible that you're seeing a dead star. Looking into the past is like sticking your thumb into the dirt of a Dixie cup. cup. But a high powered telescope changes everything. I think what I'm saying is I'd rather live than not live. 
When I was writing about my terrible late-term miscarriage, I gave a reading on the Upper East Side. Afterwards, several women came up to me to say that I was brave. So brave, they said. I was disappointed. I didn't want to be brave. I wanted to be brilliant. In hindsight, this strikes me as incredibly dim-witted. One in one women will look back on something and feel foolish. Now, I will take brave any day. I will take brave and fold it into my little kerchief and tie it to my stick and carry it to the top of the highest hill I can find. And when I get there, I'll rest my tired legs, unwrap my little hunk of humble pie from its wax paper and stare up at the brilliant, extravagant stars, knowing that they are not dead, not even one of them not dead at all, but living, pulsing, pressing their light as far as it can reach. Um, a couple more. This is to Jean Valentine. It's a true story, it happened recently. It's called A Sign. In the woods, I stood perfectly still, vowing not to move until I saw another living being. Jean, I said, I'm here. Did I place my hand on the bark of the red maple? No, it was too far away. Yesterday, I had gotten lost in these same woods. I hadn't looked behind me to see where I had come from, but today was different. I understood these woods now and planting my feet on the last on last fall's leaves, I waited. I was not so deep in the woods that I couldn't hear children laughing, a car engine turning over, the plane headed this way. There were the sounds of birds too, but I saw nothing. I was as if in a glass. I thought the deer who I'd witnessed the hour before might come or the lone cardinal, maybe the turkey vulture, which I'm often mistaking for a hawk. And when there was nothing, I thought the nothingness itself might be a sign that you can wait and wait and nothing will change. It seemed a valuable lesson, but I was unwilling to accept it. Jean, I said again, louder. And when my legs began to grow tired, my eyes searched the earth for ants, but there was no movement. I had been the one mindlessly stirring the ground. Finally, through the trees, I spotted the living beings, a woman and her dog, doing what I imagine they do every morning. Does this count? Yes. Not a very good ending, but. <laughs> um, I'll read two more. Midweek of midwinter. In the middle of my life, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the kitchen, in the middle of cooking fish, I noticed in the middle of the flounder, a bone of perfect choking size that could shift all the middles into a single tragic end. And so with a blade, I removed it. And I all but missed the magnolias. I all but missed the magnolias, all but missed the breaking of the blossoms, being so preoccupied with my own brokenness, my own breaking, another blood panel, another marker to draw another incision, another incision to take another organ, another organ no longer needed, the sky a tilt and the birds. When I was pregnant, I walked around in awe of all the people. You were once inside someone, I think, and you, and you, you grew and grew, you and you and you. I'd be at the bagel shop wrapped with tenderness that each body had grown. Now, 
same same in awe of you and you and you who just pulled your sweater over your head and you with the black dog and you smoking the joint and you and you, you grew, yes, grow and two, you will die and 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 you and you and you will die and then who will sit beneath this tree missing what's already broken? You know, if they weren't funny, they were damn good. And I, I caution people that what we poets find funny, other people might not find funny. Uh, that's the good thing about poetry. Uh, there's the, you know, Great, great stuff. Are any of these in any collection uh, past or forthcoming? No, I just like, oh, I just like to write a bunch of, oh, am I, it says I'm muted. I'm not muted. Oh, you're not muted. Not yet. I mean, they are. I actually, I'm working, um, I'm getting a collection together right now. I just need publishers. <laughs> I don't know. Where if are the publishers? Publish Raise your hand if you're a publisher. Yeah, exactly. Show your face. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. Thank you, Nicole, as always. Thank you. And glad to see you in good health as well. Um, today, in addition to being a lovely day, a spring, almost a taste of summer, is the anniversary of D-Day. Um, oddly enough, a uh, date which although we didn't celebrate in my household, uh, a date which we kind of observed since my dad was um, involved in that little beach party. Um, like many, he never spoke of that experience. Um, I never quizzed him on it, thinking that we'd have plenty of time to do so. Uh, I was wrong. He passed long before I had a chance to do that. Um, this poem, which was published in the Lily Poetry Review, was written with his in mind, with him in mind. And for all the warriors of that war who never spoke of their service. Odysseus at home. When he returned home, he hung up the uniform, the bloodstained sandals placed in a corner of the closet where he would not find them or they him. He did not speak of the war or warriors the siege of Troy, the return of Hector's body to Priam and Hecuba. After all, what was he to Hecuba? The nightmares he did not share except every so often, late at night, when the horses reared in the stable, he awoke and waited to hear if men were disgorged from their stomachs. When Telemachus demanded stories from his father, he made up some stuff about sirens or men turned into pigs which was not far from the truth. Um, our next featured poet, bouncing around from screen to screen is, is a bit uh, challenging for me, but I, I'm, I'm doing it well, I think. Um, our next featured poet of the day is Elizabeth T. Gray. Uh, Elizabeth is a poet and a translator of ancient and contemporary Persian and Tibetan literature. Um, her long poem, Salient, which draws on British World War I military materials and Tibetan rituals of protective magic, was published by New Directions in May 2020. Her book-length sequence of poems, Series India, was published by Four Way Books. Other work has appeared in the Paris Review, Little Star, Talisman, uh, Hyperallergic Dispatches from the Poetry Wars, Best New Poets 2012, the Harvard Review, the New Orleans Review, the New England Review, and other publications. The Process Series at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill selected poems from Salient for the development of Geomancy, a multimedia performance in February 2015. She has served as guest editor for Epiphany Magazine and for the New Haven Review, and as a consultant to and board member of various literary journals and organizations. And with that, the floor and the mic are yours, Elizabeth. 
Thank you, Neil. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, HVWC, for all of this. It's a pleasure to read with old friends and new, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to read from Salient, a long poem out from New Directions last year. And um, I'm going to, it's probably helpful to share the three strands from which the poem was built. One piece of it um, is, is based on the Battle of Passchendaele, which was fought by the British and Canadians in Belgian Flanders in October and November 1917. The battle was really the ultimate poster's child for the horrors of trench warfare. You know, lines of men walking uphill through mud against emplaced machine guns. Between the end of July and the middle of November, half a million men on both sides were casualties. So one thread is, is that particular battle and the contemporary chronicles and accounts and field manuals from there. Another thread is protective magic, uh, largely Tibetan. The Tibetan landscape holds demons and evil spirits. And it was believed and is still that certain rituals and spells can identify where they are and keep you safe on that terrain. Uh, the Chut rite is a method for doing so. And if you dismember yourself and feed the demons, they'll be full and you'll be safe. So those, I originally started by taking these two poles of obsession, which had obsessed me since my teenage years. We will not go into why, I don't really know. And I thought originally in the force field between them, I might find them missing. In this particular small, tiny piece of Belgium, over which people fought for four years, there were five different battles, uh, the bodies of 100,000 soldiers were never found. They drowned in shell holes and mud. They were vaporized by artillery. Even if they were quickly buried on the battlefield, uh, the graves were then lost or blown up. And the names of some of them, 57,000 of them, are carved on the Menin Gate in Ypres. These are the panels you see behind me. Those are not the names of the dead. Those are the names of the missing. And this is just one or two panels. The third strand comes from spending time on the ground itself. In 2014, over the four years of the war's centenary, I spent weeks in spring and fall walking the ground in all seasons with maps of the time. And some of these poems describe encounters there. There are many ways to string together pieces of the poem for a reading like this one. You can do it, this, the, there's the battle thread, there's the lover and beloved and lost thread, there's the magic thread, there's the artillery targeting, field engineering and aerial reconnaissance, which I will not share with you this afternoon. But in the past 18 months, I have lost so many friends and family, not to COVID, and others are gravely ill with an array of cancers. So I've chosen pieces from the poem that deal with harm and loss and the spirit or spirits that offer us a way forward. So this will not be a cheerful reading. Um, the first segment is called War Magic. And it's built from Tibetan ritual texts and contemporary British accounts of the battle. War magic. Scaled up to the level of war magic, the violent repelling rites of the Tantras became the big push, the big show, or a Schlieffen plan. Large numbers of ritual experts would assemble for performances that could last several days, if not weeks. The, requi the requisite expert officiants and necessary materials had to be assembled and elaborate shrines constructed. Legions of effigies, linga, of enemy soldiers would be fashioned from barley flour, butter, and paper, often accompanied by thousands more effigies of the enemy's horses. 
so that the practitioners in effect recreated the battlefield within the confines of a ritual space. Thus the resources required for a serious repelling rite were considerable. 450 tons of aminol for the 19 mines that went up at Messines, for example, and 33 million shells. In the last half of the female fire snake year of 1917, it was said that a great number of enemy were coming. All the farmers and nomads were terrified. 50 divisions took part in the ritual performances and in early November, the signs emerged. A great snowstorm fell. After that, a gale rose up and shreds of cloth like prayer flags froze in the craters. They were buried beneath the snow men along with their horses and pack animals. Not even one escaped death. When the snow melted, the lower Horpa and Sermio came down out of the mountains. And when they were done stripping the bodies, there was nothing there. Recalling the blah, the blah is a Tibetan word. The blah or soul can also leave the body as a result of a frightening event or unbearable pain. In such cases, it may be recalled or ordered back by means of a ritual. The blah may dwell temporarily at least in various places outside the body without risk of any danger. Hence the expression blana or dwelling of the soul a place where the blah takes up residence. It can be a rock or a tree, a pond, a small canal, or a piece of church. Some of the poems reflect conversations or pronouncements um, with what seems to be a tantric female deity, a Tibetan goddess of some kind. I was a guest at a graduate seminar at Yale Divinity School that had been using salient as a text. And one of the students asked if I had really been spoken to by a Tibetan goddess in that cemetery. I said, of course not. What do you think I am, like crazy? Um, but later, when I was writing these first drafts, uh, she seemed to be present and quite precise. This is one of the many poems in the book that's called The Missing. It was a test. She asked, are they here or not? Because the land is flat, it's hard to see. The men may be hidden in that empty space. The canal was a serious obstacle. The banks of the dikes are bordered with willows, the lyric moment at its best. At the edge of each moment, I thought I saw movement. It was a test. She asked, are they here or not? The lines kept changing, but not by much. Because the land was flat, it was hard to see. The men may be hidden in that empty space. The banks of the dikes are bordered with willows. You can read this, she said. The lines ran right through this cornfield. Corroded buttons, cap badges, numbered discs. At the edge of each moment, I thought I saw movement. When the sun came out, I was surprised. I asked, should I just go home? The canal was a serious obstacle, the lyric moment at its best. The lines kept changing, but not by much. It was a test, she asked, are they here or not? Gently, metal on metal, something on its own terms. When the sun came out, I was surprised. Their lines ran right through this cornfield. The banks of the dikes are bordered with willows. The canal was a serious obstacle. You can read this, she said. This poem takes place in Vilcha Farm Cemetery, 
uh, which is in St. Jean, just outside of Ypres. It takes place actually on the 26th of October, 2014. Um, some of the poems are specifically located according to the British grid map system of the time. So what is now a cemetery was Vilcha Farm and it was located on sheet number 28 Northwest 2, St. Julien um, in sector 6C28A. What she told me, girl, keep to these haunted places. Carry what you dare not. Cut your fetters, give up attachments. Find what here says inside you. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, inform curiosity or carry report. You are here to kneel where fear has been valid. This poem took place, takes place Northwest of Quebec Farm in late September 1917 at 20 Southeast 3 Pole Capel 525 D21. It's called Actual Things with Characteristics. If individuals have no psychic or magical abilities, then actual things with characteristics, such as the four elements hail, poison, boils, precipices, and so on become obstacles. Whenever such forms arise, remain in a state of detachment and integrate them into your path as illusions. Yesterday, when actual things with characteristics arose, a detachment tried to integrate them into its path as illusions, but the actual things with characteristics were stubborn and well led. This is called Harm. It's situated just north of Railway Wood. Map sheet 28 Northwest 4 Ypres. Harm. We are no longer confused about harm. Harm is in specific locations. I5 D91, for example, the small field 100 yards due east of Gully Farm. We strive to remain unattached without attraction or aversion to material forms, the way Phillips and Mercer did, who understood such distinctions. Most of them is still missing. This is a pair of poems set in mid-October 1917. The first is spoken by a soldier who has been stranded in a shell hole in no man's land during a night raid and can't get back to his lines. The second is spoken by his beloved, a woman in London 48 hours later, and all she knows that is that he is missing. It takes place at the southwestern edge of Decoy Wood mid-October 1917. Night, shell hole. Because I am terrified, I reach out in the darkness and touch another man's body. He is solid and protection and unaware of me lying beneath him. His remains are very still and this helps. It's cold and the water seems to rise very slowly. He is both a man and a caution here for a reason. I will wait for daylight to see where we are. The way his arm is folded, rigid with cold, offers a loophole, a way to see undetected. And this may open out into some kind of actional intelligence that might be kept, carried back and in some small way matter. I've been warned several times about this, the risks, what might happen if I raise my head. Night, bedroom, London. Because you are missing, I reach out in the darkness and touch another man's body. He is solid in protection and unaware of me weeping beneath him. 
he remains very still in this house. It's cold. He is both a man and a desperation here for a reason. Perhaps in daylight, someone will see where you are. His folded limbs act as a blind, a way not to see. And this evasion opens out into some kind of imagined evidence that things right re might remain as they were and in some small way matter. I was warned several times about this, the risks, what might happen if you raised your head. The guts of it. I think I would be, I, I think I would prefer to be killed in a railway accident, he said. Why? Because, well, there you are. But if you're killed by an exploding shell, he went on, then where the hell are you? In the soft parts of the body. In the soft parts of the body, wounds from large fragments or entire projectiles show extensive and deep contusions, crushing a tearing away of tissue. They are vast erosions, deep furrows, large lesions, often with significant pieces of flesh, hanging, fimbriated, echemiotic, contused, and frequently in their deep parts, complicated by metallic foreign bodies, by earth, by fragments of clothing, and thus doomed to superation and grave complications, gangrene and tetanus, for example. For such wounds, use a simple mdadar fletched with crow with a slender point of polished copper and its shaft painted red. To its feathered end, attach five narrow lengths of silk, yellow, white, red, blue, and green, and three sheep bone dice. Move a mirror along the patient's body until it reaches the source of his pain. At this exact location, set the arrow with its point touching the wound and begin to suck at the other end of the shaft. In this way, clots of blood, free splinters of sh shrapnel and all tissue that has lost, lost its vitality are removed. Wipe the wound surface with a pad soaked in permanganate of potassium and then apply an ointment containing corrosive sublimate, salol, antipyrene, carabolic acid, and iodoform with Vaseline as an excipient. There are three more, mostly short. The missing. Some became smoke, cloud, and rain. As when a pot breaks, the space within and the space without become intermingled. The body reduced to its atomic constituents indistinguishable from the awareness within. Others dissolved into light from their feet upwards. The heavy shelling at D6, D4, 5 west of what remained of the church, for example. And after the light faded from the sky, there were no bodies. So it is said that instead of wooden crosses, they have names planted in space. This poem takes place at the Canadian Memorial at Crest Farm near Zonabeek. What she told me, you have come back here without knowing why or when or from where. You have come back here carefully without instructions or faith. You have come back here because there has been no other place than this, where now does not exist, nor then. See, your footsteps on the ground are held by theirs. See? You stood watch as they catch a few minutes of sleep. So in Ypres, every evening since World War I, at 8 p.m., a trio of buglers plays Last Post, which is the British equivalent of taps. 
and they play it under the arch of the Menin Gate, surrounded on all sides by the lists of names that you see behind me. Taking Refuge, the playing of last posts, the Menin Gate, memorial to the missing in Ypres every evening at eight o'clock. Pick up your instrument, place it to your lips. When you play the first notes, visualize that from here to the heights of the circled hills, the missing can hear and that when the notes reach them, they stop what they are doing, come to attention and turn toward the sound. Make the next notes hang in the air. Make them say, gather here. Imagine that the men hear this that they emerge eagerly from their individual places and begin to remember themselves. When you blow the last notes, they come with great urgency, all of them. Visualize them assembled in the fields before you and imagine that they inhabit for a moment this song. Thank you all. Wow. Wow. It just um, amazing stuff, powerful stuff. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for always Thank you for having me. Share, always sharing great stuff. And uh, condolences again on those and those who have who have gone um, among your friends. Thank you. Um, you've heard your your you've heard great stuff today and you're about to hear more. Uh, our next featured poet, uh, hold on a second, let me bounce around the screen just being here, is Michael Klein. Uh, uh, Michael is the author of, he's a poet and memoirist as well. He's the author of several collections of poetry um, and memoirs. He is a Lambda Literary Award-winning fiction writer. He teaches in the MFA program at Goddard College in Vermont and Hunter College in New York City. His fourth and third books of poetry, When I Was a Twin, 2015, and The Talking Day, 2013, were both published by Sibling Rivalry Press. His writing has appeared in Plowshares, Poetry, and Oxford American. He is the author of two memoirs, Track Conditions, published by Persia Books in 1997, on his experience with Kentucky Derby winner Swale, and The End of Being Known, University of Wisconsin Press, 2003, a book of essays exploring friendship and sexuality. Uh, you can find out more about Michael by visiting his website at www.boypoet, all one word, dot com. And with that, the floor and the mic are yours, Michael. Thank you, um, Neil. Uh, I don't like fiction. Um, <laughs> so, okay. No more. That doesn't say yeah, it's okay. It's just, it, you know, it's something that I, I, I feel sometimes I've consciously avoided. I love reading it, but boy, can I not write it. Um, anyway, thank you. Uh, again, Neil, and thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for putting this together and for, for keeping um, your wonderful place alive uh, through all of this. Um, you've had quite a presence online, um, which is wonderful. Thank you. Um, I want to start with um, Jean Valentine. I'm so glad that Nicole brought the name into the room. Um, she was my best friend for many, many, many years. Um, and her death, although it was um, not a great surprise, um, was quite an absence, I assure you. I think about Jean every day. And I want to start this, this reading with an epigraph of hers. I don't know what poem it's from, and I actually don't know where I found it, but I love that she uses the word fuck or fucking in it, which whenever she used a curse word, and she, had, she has occasionally, it's always completely shocking, but, but absolutely accurate. And the epigram reads, I came to you, Lord, because of the fucking resonance, retinence, sorry, reticence of this world. No, not the world, not reticence. Oh, Lord, come, Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. This is called Provincetown, 1990. We were joined that night on the street of leisure against the bicycles and the summer people, two of us loose from the crowd and wanting a place in public to talk. But for me, more than talking, because I wanted you in body and couldn't figure out how to push language through the desire of that. 
I stood still, sunburned and shuddered, young to love, absent-minded about it. Soon at our feet, something strange was moving, shooting past us very low, something invisible, a tube of solid air. How could we have seen it? But we did see it in all its being dark and somehow saw through it too, as if its ability to be seen was part of the mystery of what it was. It made the street look rippled and the town set aside in that moment ominous and you said something dark just happened did you see it and of course i did and in the years since the years of dread and anticipation i see it still in different places with different people who don't understand what force it is they're seeing with and what we first saw that summer ago dark rippling into dark when it started out small through us first to get where it was going and finish bigger being all of what it was there down the road a little where it met the future of another world. <laughs> um, I sort of was became uh, obsessed again with Rilke during the, um, the forced occupation. <laughs> How I like to refer to it. This is called after reading how Rodin gave Rilke an idea, which gave me an idea about the earth. What inspired Rilke to have more feeling when he wrote at the door of angels, making requiem and elegy mean beyond the living who wouldn't leave completely their life. But I could be wrong. He may have been thinking, I'm not in the world. Rodin never looked for Rilke. Rodin made art that was heavier than the source, heavier than the gravity key to earth. His famous thinker was going to be called the poet, which explains the light energy moving inside the bronze. Rodin could see beyond making form to being inside form, which shook when Rodin looked. I'm sorry, when Rilke looked. Rilke and Rodin, I always get those two confused. <laughs> the early minutes of without, I'm putting together, I just put together a new and selected, which I thought was completely um, premature since I haven't written enough books, except that the first two books of mine that were published are completely out of print. And rather than approach a publisher with reprinting something, I felt that it was um, a better idea to do a new and selected. And I actually love putting it together um, because it looks like a completely new book to me. And I actually should be calling it Poems Revised and New, which I actually might do because I revised everything as I went through them again. Um, the way that I remember Joni Mitchell, I used to see her a lot in concert and she never sang the same song twice, which is part of her genius, but you would never know that if you never saw her live. Anyway, this is called been obsessing about Johnny Mitchell too. This is called The Early Minutes of Without. <laughs> you thought you were spared falling in love with another drunk now that you were sober and could feel the ordinary grain that ran through everything. You were awake in the great city and you moved among the civilians you couldn't move among before. And you were almost finished with how to structure time and dress for the weather. And love did bring a man who told you once coming in from the dark and a last cigarette that he missed you, that already. And told you that a person could miss somebody even more in the early minutes of without. And you were close to him then in the barely lit and you stayed. And one day in the future he drank, summer's first, then now, because people drink, it's the truth but you couldn't remember it. And you look sometimes at how he was different in some new degree, a few drinks took him. And then you try to judge or argue or put a rule on the feeling to make it formal. You try to scan a bigger source of restlessness about life, that it has to bear sometimes the opposite of living. You wanted to say it wasn't him you didn't want anymore, just not him drunk, what anyone would say the first time. You wanted the man from that time, you were both barely lit when he was a god in the firmament, when he was dazzled by love, maybe even drunk with it. Um, many years now ago, um, I had the privilege of being in the hospital room with a dear friend named Billy Ferlenza, 
who was friends with um, six other people in the room, um, Michael Cunningham, Nick Flynn, Marie Howe. He had great friends um, for being a cook, I have to say, which he was mostly in his life. And we were given the opportunity to wash his corpse after he died. The nurse came in and asked us if we wanted to do that. And I had never washed a corpse before. And Rilke again have a, has a poem about this. So we did, um, it was just the men, which I always thought was kind of strange, but Nick and Michael and I washed Billy after he died. It's called Washing the Corpse. Spirit always wants the door. After he was dead, they washed his body. Nick and Michael and Michael stood in Billy's hospital room and took the washcloth or whatever it was, something rising hot out of silver basin and started at his feet and worked their way up the body that was only his body on a bed. And Marie and Janice and Julie were in the room when the spirit was directing the air. And when they left, it was only the men now doing the last thing that would ever be done to Billy's body. They were making Billy new. They were making Billy what was over. Um, this is a poem that I'm happy to say is in the current issue of the Paris Review. Um, I'm sure some other poets can identify with those little journals that you always want to be published in and you never think it's going to take 20 years to be published in. Um, but it took at least 20 years. You know, I just stopped and then I started again. This is called The Animals, The Animals. Here I am, I've been watching the animals. I watch them in the afternoon that seems to drop my being lower into time. Bullfrogs singing from the long grasses, horses captured in a video. Wild is a horse's word. They are running wild on an island and ending sharply as if stopped by something that isn't there. I've been watching the animals move through sudden predicaments or work like joy from a habit as in the sea turtle pulling her anvil body down to the continent of ocean after leaving her eggs in the upper sands. She's returning to single life and the sequenced minutes of light breaking softly on the surface of the water. How delicate it is below where daylight doesn't reach all the wet and slippery green there. One world brushing up against the gardens of another. I've been watching the animals with more knowing now than childhood secret knowing, secret gratitude for animals. And my spirit seems to make music I can hear for each animal, like a theme for staying. Only once did the dog run away. I've been watching them with a sense of circling back into myself through their own restlessness, feeling their nature take the wheel of what's on again, off again in my own life. The life of human stories beginning in deliverance and ending up torn from reaching the eventual. There is nothing in the world to confirm or not confirm the fear that I will stay like this, Deluge, disillusioned with everything that isn't animally connected or unconditional. I will always regret not staying with someone only for love. And so remain powerless over the photogenic grief of empty stations that once held people. I will always be just this the human boy, the human man, who goes to the animals, the animals to check, to see. And as it was mentioned, thank you, as it was mentioned in my, the glittering introduction of my section of this reading, um, in another life, clearly another life, I was indeed a groom to a Kentucky Derby winner in 1984. The horse's name was Swale, which is a word um, I actually saw, the only time I've seen that word in print was in a poem by Stanley Kunitz of all things, which felt like, you know, I knew Stanley and that felt like a very weird connection. Um, but Swale was a big part of my life. I wrote a book about him, um, a memoir about, um, I, he also got me sober. Um, anyway, this is called Swale. It's Derby Day, 
And it's been 50, 30 years since 1984 when I stood in the grandstand at Churchill Downs after betting 20 bucks on Swale, the horse I groomed and watched as he pulled away from Wayne Lucas's great filly Althea to run the hundred, win the 110th running of the race. 30 years and a lot of souls have risen to the upper register of life. And my own life has made more reachable by what their love did to me. I read some books and wrote some books and watched performances that moved my thinking. I've seen the man who gave me horses go home to his mother. And I've seen other horses break down or go home to the grasses of their beginning to make more of their pleasing kind. And after it all, I met the love of my life. And when the government turned something over, I foolishly married him. Foolishly, only because all marriage is foolish and errand into a maze. It's Derby Day and I'm remembering my life in a stable and the ordinary living that spilled around it. I've eaten good food in places that had views of the everlasting. And I'm certain I've seen the face of God on more than one occasion. And I've held animals so close to my own body that something in theirs must have passed through mine. But nothing has given me more life than watching that big, black, beautiful, shiny soul run through the animal line, past all comprehension, into the music of his speed, and win that race on the first Saturday in May in the year of forever. Here's to Swale and to others of his kind, creature of my joy, of my sorrow. And I have two short ones. I think I have enough time. I didn't time this. I never do time it because I always think I have enough time. So I never time it because I always think I have enough time. I never time it because I always think I have enough time. I never time it. <laughs> you know, I did this thing. I, I was part of the Geraldine Dodge poetry thing. Um, that that huge thing that happens in New Jersey. I'm very, very privileged to have been there. I never thought that, you know, it was something that would ha happen. And, um, you know, it's high school students walking around the streets of New Jersey with your book that they bought at the book sale. I mean, it's, it's so great. But there was, I was on a panel. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. It was with three other poets. And I can't remember what the subject was. But at one point, I broke into... Um, a song <laughs> that just sort of came to himself. It happens. It's called Rooms We Didn't Live In. And by the way, I'm reading from all, it's a whole, um, it's from a bunch of books. It's not, they're not all new. Some of them are new, some of them are very old. This is very old. It's from my first book, Rooms We Didn't Live In. When drinking luck brought me mystery and money, I holed up in the Capri Motor Lounge on Hempstead Turnpike because I could deal with the small world of a vodka stupor floating me under the reflection in a mirrored ceiling of crisp $100 bills circled like green fire around the bed. I won it on a horse. I think of that day whenever it feels like I'm not getting whatever, enough. What is God's will after he makes, lets you live? Who is that money for? This is called Based on a Review of a New Book by Lydia Davis, written by Peter Orner. Two wonderful writers. I love Peter Orner, especially. I don't know if, if any of you know his work, he's a fantastic writer. He writes nonfiction mostly. He's written novels too. You really have to have joy around your brain when you're reading Lydia Davis. You have to practically forget you know about reading. Otherwise, you might feel like Kate, who, when she stood with her mother in front of Picasso's bouquet of peace, said she could have painted the hand with all the flowers in it. And her mother said, ah, dear, but you didn't. I will close. I'm a twin, among other things. But I, my twin died, my twin brother died in 2002. So what does that make me? A twin or the twin who was a twin? And the new, uh, my new book is called When I Was a Twin. And this is called The Twin. I wasn't supposed to have a body. I'm not from a family of bodies. None of us were supposed to have bodies. But then the light left us in a dark chamber and each one of us stood in the hall of her old heart beating. 
My mother and my brother were there. I was inhabiting a body of company. Could I have my own apart from the one I was inside, apart from the one floating next to me, which looked like mine? My soul was already confused. It didn't know how consciousness pulls the body into the world or pulls it out of the world. My soul was inside the inside. All this, I was thinking, still lying there in my mother's cocktail, only a light filling in a body, frail in the counter music of my brother's heart, singing in my brother's body and in the same time of his body that mine was in. Then, 48 years later, my brother died and dropped his body on the bed, and I carried the effect of him afterwards down some coiling stairs into the streets of Boston, music, garments, literature, some beauty stuff. When he was living, we used to dare each other. I dare you, he said. I dare you. And then he died. Thank you, everybody. Wow, wow. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Your poem about uh, watching and washing the body of your friend uh, brings to mind just a little bit of uh, Judaica uh, to throw in. One of the highest um, good deeds or mitzvot that one can do, according to the great sage Maimonides, is what you did. Uh, it's actually, there's actually a name for it in Hebrew. It's called Shomrim. It's the person who, who between death and burial, watches and washes the body of the deceased. Oh, wow. and, it is, and it is considered the highest good deed you can do because there is no way the deceased can return the favor to you. Wow, that's good. Neil, can you put that word in the chat? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sure. Yeah, the, the Hebrew word is shomrim, and it actually translates. It's one of those Hebrew words which really has no good translation. It's like German. Right. Um, it, it it literally means guard, but if you're referring to a security guard or a military guard, you would not use that word. Right. Uh, it has a unique meaning, and the meaning applies to the person who watches and washes the body of the deceased, as I did with my father. Um, and it is it, it is obviously a very sobering experience, but it's also an a, a incredible expression of love because you are sending this person, your friend or your relative to the next world. Right, right. Clean, <laughs> you right. know, clean as a daisy. Um, right. Um, and nothing to do with embalming, nothing to do with any of that stuff, nothing to do with makeup. You are basically, in fact, you're actually removing all sorts of makeup, all sorts of artifice and returning them to the earth as they were. It's a, it's a great expression of love. Yes, of course, I would be happy to send it to you. With great. pleasure. Thank you. Um, don't go away, folks, because you're about to be treated to some amazing music care, care of an amazing violinist. Conchetta Abate, and Conchetta, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, uh, is a classically trained violinist turned improviser and composer. Uh, Grammy.com described her original performances as a mix of, quote, violin and delicate vocals that float between the worlds of modern classical, neo-folk, and poignant and poetic verse. Close quote, those are nice words. Uh, as an instrumentalist and a singer, she has performed with countless orchestras and ensembles in New York. She has worked as a studio recording artist for bands including Cornelius E.D. Trio, of whom much can be said, uh, and Latin music group Inti and the Moon. She is a founding member of the Sparrow Song Ensemble. She has released four full-length studio albums of her original music, um, and I hope she will tell us where you can find them. Spanning genres of new classical jazz, experimental, and folk, she has scored full dance productions in collaboration with choreographers from Arch Company Ballet, as well as Wendy Osterman Dance Company. Her dance scores have been performed at Lincoln Center, as well as Theater for the New City. She has traveled as a distinguished composer in residence to TAKT, Takt Gallery in Berlin, as well as the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation in Captiva Island, Florida. And if that's not enough, she founded a music education program called Teacup Music, which provides sliding scale music lessons to students in Brooklyn. Uh, she's a mentor to, to a vibrant community of students. Her teaching work has received grants and recognition from Brooklyn Arts Council, the Ruth Burt Fund, and the Charles Mayer Foundation. 
Uh, and with that, the floor and the mic and the violin are yours, Conchetta. I hope you're there. Hey, wow, you read like the long version of my bio. <laughs> I did, I was, I, was trying to, I was giving you an opportunity to tune up. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, oh, and, and, one, and one more thing, and Conchetta's recently engaged. <laughs> Join me in congratulating her. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me today. And thank you for uh, all the wonderful poets that read today. It was really wonderful listening to everyone. Very inspiring. Um, I, uh, I do have um, albums that are available on my Bandcamp page. And I shared that link with the host of the meeting. So maybe they could put that in the chat box. And you guys could um, check out where you can purchase my music. Um, I, uh, I think the first thing I would like to play is a song that I wrote, um, which was originally a poem and then I set it to music. Um, and it's kind of about this, you know, childhood home that I grew up in, in Long Island. And it's from my album Falling in Time. And since this is a poetry reading, I think it's an appropriate song for me to play. So thanks everyone for listening. like that song and a lot of other songs that I've written for violin and voice on my album uh, Mirror Touch and also my album Falling in Time. Um, but next I'm going to play for you a piece that I did not compose. It's written by a Japanese composer named Kaniko Millar and it's like one of the most creative and fun to play violin pieces that I've played recently and um, it's based off of the folk melody Sakura or Sakura. It's a little bit late for cherry blossom season. Um, but what's really interesting about the piece is that she, you, she uses the violin as a koto, which is like a Japanese instrument. And like, she just uses this really cool extended technique on the violin. So it kind of sounds like a koto. So I hope you guys enjoy this piece. Um, Sakura arranged by Kaniko Millar.
you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just think that's such a cool creative piece. And along the themes of nature and springtime and also the cicadas coming out, um, the next piece I've prepared for you is um, a violin sonata written by a composer named Paul Hindemith. Um, you know, it's kind of like World War I era, so it's a little bit dark. Um, but I think it's really interesting because the piece is actually called The Weather is So Fine Outside. And the description is, is it says to play the piece in easy motion. Um, and but the piece sounds very I mean, I, I guess I don't want to give too much away. But, you know, listen for the sounds of insects and broods of cicadas and things like that. <laughs> see you all clapping. Um, you know what? I didn't even think to do this, but I can spotlight my video. Ta-da! I know, I know this because I teach music on Zoom all day. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the next piece I'll play for you is, um, actually, this is a fun one. Um, this is a piece uh, that's from Sicilian uh, Tarantella, like folk music. And my grandparents are Sicilian. That's where my name comes from, um, named after my grandmother. And um, it's called Froni Dalia. It's like a medieval melody that um, the lyrics of the piece are about like a young girl who has to get married to some guy that she doesn't like. And she lies to him and says that the Virgin Mary appeared to her and told her that she like couldn't sleep in his room. And so she runs away in the middle of the night before the, the wedding. And so that's what the story is about. And so I was inspired by Kaniko Millar and like I took this traditional Sicilian folk song and I arranged it for classical violin. So it's kind of like a folk classical fusion interpretation of this piece. And this is called Froni Dalia.
Yeah. That was amazing. That was amazing. Gorgeous. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, you can buy my albums on my Bandcamp page. Um, and thanks again for having me today. Oh, our profound pleasure. I could have I, uh, more. I just want to hear more and more. <laughs> you know, I wish we had all the time in the world. Thank you so much. My thanks again to all the poets who read so beautifully today. Uh, Nicole Callahan, Tina Kane, uh, Liz Gray, and Michael Klein, who had to walk his dog, unfortunately. And to top it all off, Conchetta Abate on her just gorgeous violin playing. Thank you again. Uh, profound thanks, heartfelt thanks to Jennifer Franklin um, and her colleagues at, at Hudson Valley Writers Center for hosting this event virtually and for all they present to support the literary arts. Please check out their website and check out their upcoming programs, uh, virtual and live. Um, all of the poets who read and Conchetta as well. If you have upcoming events, virtual or live, please feel free to share them on the Voices of Poetry page. If I hear about them, you know I will post them. If you, if people listening are on the Book of Face, um, check out the Voices of Poetry page. I occasionally post there, but only on days ending in Y. Um, please, please, please continue to support poetry in the spoken word. It is so important. This fall, and both fingers and eyes crossed, and you can't see, but my toes are crossed as well. Uh, we will return to presenting live and in-person events. Um, this September, we will present um, our a live and in-person event at Greenpoint Library on that library's rooftop garden, a, the maiden performance at that library. And in October, an event which means a lot, well, they all mean a lot, but um, given my, given the fact that I'm first generation and the son of immigrants, um, we're having an event at Jefferson Market Library, which has just been remodeled, and in the village. And we will have poets. Liz, you would be interested in this. Iraj Anvar is one of the poets reading in Farsi and English. Um, we will have um, David Thomas Martinez reading his work in Spanish and in English. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, we will have David Deffy reading his work in Georgian, not as in the state of Georgia, but as the Republic of Georgia. And I forget who else we're going to have, but it's called Voices of Poetry in Their Native Tongues, uh, which is um, poets reading their work in their original languages and in English translation. I will read a few poems that I've written in Yiddish uh, in an English translation, which will be a real stretch because I have not read poems in Yiddish in a long, long time. Um, so check the Voices of Poetry page where we'll announce what we made, but please check out the events coming up at the Hudson Valley Writers Center. Um, please support poetry in the spoken word. And uh, thank you all for coming, for spending part of your afternoon with us. Thanks again to the poets who read. Thanks again to Pajetta who performed so beautifully. Thank you, Jennifer. I can't even see your picture, but I'm sending you kisses. Thank you so oh. much. Thank you, Neil. Oh, there you are. Thank you there to you all are. of you for coming. And don't forget to check out the video, um, which yes. will be up on the website soon. And wishing you all disgustingly and unremittingly good health from this point forward. All right. Thank you all. It was great to hear yes. your work. Thank you all. Bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>